Welcome Folkaroos, welcome to Fabric of Folklore. My name is Vanessa Y. Rogers, and this is a podcast where we unravel the mysteries of folklore. And in this podcast, we really dive deep into the legends, the myths, the fables, the folk tales, and our traditions. We explore why uh, these stories and traditions mean something, how they've changed, and why they're significant and relevant to today, and why you should even care about it. So make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single one of these episodes. Go ahead and subscribe right now. Today we're exploring Aesop beyond Greece and Rome, the back and forth of the Aesopic, is that how you say it? Aesopic or Aesopic? Aesopic. Aesopic tradition. Aesopic usually. And how the stories from other places became assimilated into the later Aesopic tradition in Europe. And our guest is Dr. Laura Gibbs, and she completed her PhD in comparative literature at UC Berkeley. And her dissertation was in Aesop. And she taught at the University of Oklahoma in mythology and folklore for over 20 years before retiring in 2021. So thank you so much for joining us today. This is gonna be a great episode. Well, thanks for the invitation. I love talking about Esau. <laughs> well, so tell us a little bit about you and how you found folklore and mythology to begin with, uh, or how it found you. Well, I um, was a Polish and Russian major uh, at UC Berkeley way back in the day when I was an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And of course, the fairy tale and folktale traditions of Eastern Europe are really marvelous. And so I'd gotten very interested in all of that. And then I learned Latin and Greek, mostly, to be honest, not because I was that interested in the ancient Greeks and Romans, but so that I could read Renaissance literature uh, in Latin, mm. um, because Latin was a great unifying language all over Europe, including Eastern Europe uh, during the Renaissance. And then, you know, years go by, I was living and working in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'd gone to a bookstore. This is how I... Um, I, I discovered there was more to Aesop than I ever expected. So I'd gone to a bookstore and um, my yoga teacher told me, oh, you should read poetry by Rumi. Have you ever heard of Rumi? And no, I hadn't. This was back in the late 80s. And so I got a book of poetry by this Persian, classical Persian poet, translated into English that I found at our local bookstore in Nashville back then, you know, before Amazon and yeah. everything. And I'm reading along in this book of poetry just sitting in the parking lot because it was so good and I was just captivated by the whole idea of this book. And there was an Aesop's fable in there, the story of the frog and the mouse. And I thought, what? wait, <laughs> what is an Aesop's fable doing in this book of mystical, classical, Persian, Sufi poetry? Uh -huh. I don't understand. And so I started asking questions and that's how I ended up going back to graduate school and studying Aesop and and working on Aesop for the past, whatever it is, 30, 40 years. Um, and I know some of the answers to the questions, but, th but these are kind of big, mysterious questions, uh -huh. some of them about how Aesop has traveled around. Uh, so that's where it started for me. And, and I'm still kind of at that moment, that juncture of how did it happen that these familiar fables from ancient Greece and Rome show up in these unexpected parts of the world. How interesting. So, um, so, Tell us who Aesop was and how far back well, did he live? Like what, when did he, who lived during his time period? Well, we're not, we don't have any strictly speaking historical evidence for an actual historical person named Aesop. Okay. What we have is lots of evidence for the legend of Aesop, for the idea of Aesop. It's a lot like the situation with Homer, not as ancient as Homer probably, but what you probably have to imagine is that there were all these animal fables in circulation and also just jokes and stories, short uh, uh, stories that are very easy to, to just tell mm -hmm. orally because they're very short and also very easy for people to learn because since they're so, so short, like a joke or something, you just hear it once or twice and you're ready to tell it uh -huh. yourself. You know, the the Odyssey or the Iliad, you hear it once, you're not ready to tell it yourself. But a short fable or a joke, you're ready to tell yourself. And so these stories spread and they became associated already in ancient Greece with some storyteller named Aesop. So there probably was a storyteller somewhere 
at some point named Aesop who had a reputation. And so stories just started to attach to his name, that type of story. Oh, that's an Aesop's fable. Uh, kind of like the way you see all kinds of quotations on the internet attributed, say, to, to Mark Twain or the Dalai Lama. You know, he became a name that you attach things to. Um, but there, there is information about a historical Aesop, if you want to call it that, in Herodotus. But Herodotus, ancient Greek historian, the father of lies, you know, not exactly a reliable historical source. But that gives you a sense of, of how old the legend is, that it was already circulating in ancient Greece. And there are references to, to Aesop, uh, a storyteller, uh, a former slave. That's the one I had um, heard, that he was a former slave, that, that, um, but that's a legend? It's it's a it's a legend, but you know, if if so many people believed it to be true, you can believe it to be true, right? So if Aristotle thinks it's true, heck, you might as well think it's true too. So you find references to Aesop, sometimes with an emphasis on his lowly origins, but sometimes not. Sometimes in an effort to present him more as a kind of um, uh, uh, storytelling artist, a philosopher. It, it, there's a range of ways that he's represented. But you know, centuries go by, and the and the Aesop legends keep circulating. There's a wonderful collection of Aesop's fables, the oldest extant collection that we have, by a Roman poet named Phaedrus, who himself was a freedman, a freed slave. But what's really interesting is that there's also a, a whole book about the legendary life of Aesop. It's sometimes uh, called the the Romance of Aesop or the Life of Aesop, and that's where this idea that he was a a slave uh, takes on beautiful, full form. This is a whole novel in Greek about Aesop that starts with him being a slave, mm -hmm. tells how he, he was a mute slave. He was physically deformed and he also could not speak. Uh, but in this wonderful, miraculous moment, he shows kindness to a priestess of Isis and the goddess uh, ends up granting him the power of speech and so he becomes beloved of the muses and on and on um and with his power of speech he denounces the cruel overseer uh he gets sold to a new master a philosopher with whom he engages in all kinds of of contests of speech um uh and that ancient greek novel it's it it makes it clear that aesop was not for children back in the day because it's filled with all kinds of sexual jokes and oh. sexual innuendo definitely not safe for children. So if people are interested in reading the life of Aesop, it was regularly included in collections of Aesop's fables in the Renaissance, uh, in early modern texts, as late as someone like Roger Lestrange, uh, a 17th century English author of Aesop's fables. Um, the, the life of Aesop was considered fully a part of, of, of the Aesopic tradition and the Aesopic corpus. But as the fables became seen more and more for children, the life of Aesop was cast aside. Uh, but you can read it, like I said, in Roger Lestrange's 17th century Aesop. There's a wonderful book uh, by a classicist who's also a folklorist named uh, William Hansen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a collection called An Anthology of Greek Popular Literature, I think is what he calls it. And the life of Aesop is in there along with uh, fables. It's an absolutely uh, fabulous book, that anthology of uh, ancient Greek popular literature. So what about his story? You said it was definitely not intended for for children or, you know, what about his his life um, was that stands out to you in terms of that the it wasn't intended for children? Oh, that well, for example, in the in the. Uh, w when he is uh, uh, bought by this philosopher at a slave market, uh, the philosopher is buying a slave at the bidding of his wife, who would like to have a young, sexy male slave to sleep with. Oh! And when her <laughs> husband brings home this appalling looking, foul mouthed, ugly slave, she is extremely disappointed, and they have a very explicit back and forth, uh, Aesop and the 
uh, his uh, new master's wife about her expectations and uh, how she has been thwarted in her desire for a sex partner and uh, their their rivalry continues throughout his um, his stay at her house. So wow, there's just so many questions. There, so that's <laughs> that's a hilarious story. Are there any other good stories like that in in his uh, in his life? There are lots of good stories, and I highly recommend the life of Aesop. It is not a sophisticated work of literature, uh-huh. but it is good fun from start to finish, and people have gotten interested in it as a document about slavery in the ancient world mm-hmm. too you know so once again in the same way that that the, the the legend of Aesop is not historical information you know the life of Aesop it's a work of, of of fantasy of imagination of literature it's not a historical document about actual slaves in uh, the ancient Greek world but it gives you some insight into into how people, imagine that world, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like the way Roman comedy does, you know, where the, the, the tricky slave is a regular feature of Roman comedy. Aesop falls into that how same far, tradition of the How far tricky after slave. his life was he, was that book written? Um, oh, hundreds, hundreds of years, okay. hundreds of years. So, so we're talking about, this is probably something from, oh, I don't know what the dates are on it. It's late, you know, it's, it's, Let's say so they wouldn't have had personal experience with what life was like during that during his time. Realism is not a part <laughs> of the ancient Greek literary tradition <laughs> in general, and in particular with the life of Aesop. You're not there for the realism. But here, since we're supposed to be talking about Aesop beyond Greece and Rome, let me recommend an absolutely astounding modern novel by a writer from India. Uh, named Suniti Namjoshi, and the novel is called Foxy Aesop, and it's a it's a modern novel, short, uh-huh. I don't know, 120 pages, 150 pages, if I'm remembering correctly, about the life of Aesop that was inspired by the incidents in the uh, the novel Life of Aesop, but also inspired by the clear connections between. Aesop's Fables in India. And as I said, this is a wonderful writer, uh, uh, born in India, grew up in India. Uh, She then uh, uh, immigrated to Canada. She now lives in the UK, um, where she takes the idea of Aesop having come from India, blends it with the plot of the uh, ancient Greek novel about Aesop, and then adds her own amazing twists at the end, especially regarding the legend of the the death of Aesop at the hands of the people of the city of Delphi. Anyway, I highly recommend it. It's a uh, foxy Aesop and you can. We'll put a like link up on our, our, our page, www.fabricoffolklore.com and we'll, we'll, we'll make sure people Fantastic. have a link to that. And what about that? The book that you mentioned before, is that a book that is available to readers? Is it easily um, accessible? Well, and let me say something about that. It's accessible right now. The book by William Hansen, at the amazing internet archive, archive Mm archive.org, which currently has millions of books, millions of books that are available for borrowing online, like at a library. Right. You get an account, free account, and you can check these books out and uh, read them online. And anyone can get an account there? Exactly, anybody in the world. It's it's an absolutely amazing project. It's been going on for about, eight years, the book lending, the uh, Internet Archive has been online for about 25 years. That's where the Wayback Machine is. A lot of people know the Internet Archive from the Wayback Machine that archives old versions of web pages. Okay. So they've had this uh, library project going on for eight years where they have been getting uh, either books that they buy or that are donated by libraries. Lots of library discards end up there. They scan the books and make them available for borrowing with a system called controlled digital lending. So only one person can check out a book at a time, just like at a library. So if everybody rushes to go get the anthology of ancient Greek popular literature right now at the Internet Archive, only one person can check it out at a time. And you'll be told someone else has it checked out. You can come back later to read it. Unfortunately, uh, 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 in 2020, uh, during the pandemic, the, um, the, Big publishers like Hachette and Penguin sued the Internet Archive to get this lending library shut down. 
that lawsuit has has dragged on for the past couple of years. I was a a witness in the lawsuit uh, speaking on behalf of the Internet Archive because I love this library. Um, And the judge recently issued a decision in favor of the publishers against the Internet Archive. Long story, but that library may be shut down so that the copyrighted books that you can check out there, like William Hansen's book, won't be available perhaps uh, uh, within the next few weeks. We're still waiting for the actual uh, 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 details of the judgment. But the Internet Archive also has enormous quantities of public domain books, uh, so books that are 100 or more years old. So all the beautiful Renaissance editions of Aesop's fables, Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the, uh, first English version, a 15th century version, of Aesop's Fables in English, published by William Caxton, which includes the life of Aesop uh, with illustrations. Uh, All of those are available at the Internet Archive, archive archive.org. And one of the projects I'm working on right now is to do a reader's guide uh, to Aesop resources at the Internet Archive, because it really is spectacular. So going back to the lawsuit, I'm confused as to why the publishers would be suing the archive because isn't that what a regular library does they have books that are copyrighted and they lend them out to lenders and they bring them back and how is that any different than what happens at a regular library well one thing to to speculate on is i don't think publishers would have allowed regular libraries to come into existence if it were happening right now you know fortunately libraries were established in a day and a time before we had these mega corporate publishers. Um, But they can't do anything to stop libraries from doing what they're doing, which is to lend physical books. The real argument right now is about eBooks. You know, libraries right now can buy a physical book. And when a library buys a physical book, they have all kinds of rights that go with that ownership, which is what allows them to, to lend the books out. Publishers, as a general rule, the big publishers will not sell ebooks to libraries. They learn their lesson from those physical books. They will not sell the ebooks. They will only rent them to libraries and often at very exorbitant prices. And so there's a much larger uh, 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 legal um, uh, uh, contest, let's call it, uh, going on about ebooks and price gouging uh, by publishers uh, uh, with regard to those ebooks. And so the Internet Archives lawsuit sort of got swept up in that in the sense that even though what the Internet Archive is doing is not the same as an ebook, these are just page scans of physical books. So the Internet Archive starts with a physical book, some person sits at a scanner and scans them page by page. Yeah. All those millions of books have been scanned page by page. And what you can do is look at the scan. Uh, you can't highlight. You can't read it on right. your phone. It's it's very limited. But because of the precedent that it sets of the digitizing of a physical book and the extension of that idea of ownership of a physical book, morphing into ownership of the digital version of that physical book, that's what the publishers were were very anxious to stop, Mm. to stop libraries of any kind, not just the Internet Archive, from being able to digitize their own books and then lend the digital versions as they they would lend Mm. the physical books. Okay. there's some, there's some great people who've written about this. Kyle Courtney, a, a librarian at Harvard, who really pioneered the idea of controlled digital lending. Um, so you can find lots of resources online. If you just Google Internet Archive Publishers, yeah. uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of information about the lawsuit. And like I said, it's still ongoing. There's definitely going to be an appeal mm-hmm. of, of the judgment that was issued. Um, but I'm very worried that the, the, the access to all those books is going to be shut down. And it's just a tragedy if it is because it's a library that everybody can access. Yeah. So I'm fortunate in Austin. I have an amazing local public library. Not everybody does. And uh, like I said, there are millions of books right now that you can borrow at the Internet Archive this way. It's a, a mythology and folklore paradise in terms of uh, mythology yeah. books, fairy books, folktale books. It's absolutely amazing. Well, wonderful. Well, I, I, that's an interesting story to uh, definitely watch. And I, I, you know, I, I know that that 
is it such a complicated issue? Because I know that there are publishing companies that are going out of business. So I know that there's, you know, a give and take, but I love my library. <laughs> I, I, right. I get so many books from the library. So it, it's always concerning when libraries don't have access to books. Um, so the Internet Archive has become my library of choice just because I love the idea that everything is just a click away for anybody. Right. You know, so what I can get at my local library, maybe other people can't get at their local library, but we can all, at least right now, use the Internet Archive as our, our, um, our global library, not our local library. So tell us a, a little bit about who, do you know who was the first person to start collecting these Aesopic fables? How did, how did they start being put together in books? Well, yeah, I'm not the kind of person, to be honest, who is uh, interested in who did things first. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when it comes to something like an oral tradition, everybody was collecting Aesop's mm -hmm. fables. You know, it's not the, the, the fables are not the prerogative of a specific writer or a specific collective mm -hmm. uh, uh, collector. They existed in, in the, in the cultural shared space of ancient Greece and ancient Rome and Africa and India, you know, these, these, these kinds of short fables are uh, really a, a global storytelling phenomenon. But we are fortunate that the Greeks did like to collect things. They collected all kinds of things and they did collect fables and proverbs. And, and um, uh, the best place to find out about this for people who really want the nitty gritty details, there's a, an English folklorist, uh, a very famous English folklorist of the 19th century, Joseph Jacobs, who many people might know from his very popular uh, fairy tale books, English fairy tales, Celtic fairy tales, Joseph Jacobs. He was extremely interested in Aesop's fables, and he did a beautiful uh, two-volume edition in the 19th century of the first printed Aesop in English, Caxton's Aesop, where uh, he reprints Caxton's Aesop in modern type, which makes it much easier to read because 15th century typeface, I tell you, it is not easy to read. But in the first volume of that book, he does a history of Aesop's fables as uh, it was known to him as a scholar in the 19th century. He worked uh, uh, very diligently on a lot of these questions about who did what first, which fables are the oldest. And that's a very accessible uh, uh, introduction, um, really well written, really clear. And since that's a 19th century book, uh, that's available the Internet Archive, unaffected by the lawsuit. So I'll make sure I get you a link to, okay. uh, to that book because Joseph Jacobs, uh, uh, he looked not just at who was the first to collect fables in ancient Greece, but just looked at all the different collections and how they interacted with each other. Uh, he was especially interested in Jewish traditions and the way that uh, 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 Jewish writers and um, provided a kind of conduit for Aesop's fables as they circulated out into the Middle East and then back from the Middle East uh, to medieval Europe, Renaissance Europe, especially England. Uh, so it's, it's a fascinating story that goes way beyond uh, just who was the first collector in ancient Greece. Like I said, the oldest extant collection that we have is a set of poems uh, by a Roman poet named Phaedrus, uh, and that's uh, very well attested. You can find editions of Phaedrus for um, uh, and what uh, year beginning was that? students. Uh, he was a freedman of the household of the Emperor Augustus, oh, uh, and wow. so we don't have we don't have dates. But he writes about uh, contemporary Romans. He writes about Tiberius, for example, mm -hmm. in his his fables, and so you can find lots of English translations of Phaedrus. And like I said, you can also find lots of school book editions of Phaedrus because he was regularly used as a kind of school text for learning Latin um, in the Middle Ages, Renaissance, and, and even today there's some great uh, uh, 20th and there might be some 21st century school editions of, of Phaedrus. So why is it called Aesopic fables if they're not from one specific person? Why, why is that label attached to the word fables? Well, and, and so, you know, a, a fabula is, is any kind of story, any kind of what we would call a, a fictitious story. Okay. And it's, it's from the, uh, the Latin word fabulare, which is related just to the word for speaking. 
Mm-hmm. And in the later Romance languages, that's where we get, for example, uh, the Spanish hablar is is from fabulare. You know, so the idea of not just telling stories, but this whole kind of communicating with mm-hmm. one another. We do it through speaking, through telling stories as we speak. That's where you get the word hablar in Spanish. And interestingly, in other Romance languages, like in French or Italian, the word to speak, Parlare in Italian is from parabolare, to tell parables, which is the Greek equivalent of fabulare. So this idea of the fabulae and the the parables um, is very deep in the language, very important part of what people did when they spoke to each other. Uh And what makes a fable aesopic, as opposed to other kinds of, of, of myths and fables, is that it's short, and it usually has some kind of punchline at the end or or a moral something that kind of sums it up in a really pithy way at the end and one of my favorite things about the written collections of Aesop's fables is how you can see the shift between what happened in an oral say performance of an Aesop's fable Mm -hmm. and what happens when you've got uh, the the editorial space that that uh, written fables give you Um, and so in that written space the fables can get longer and longer in a way that they really didn't do in the oral space. And you can also have more authorial commentary than you do in a typical kind of oral performance. Um, a lot what do you of mean? Aesop- what do you mean? Can you give us an example of an authorial commentary that you would oh, see? If- if you if you look at at, at Phaedrus, for example, sometimes he just goes on. He has his pet peeves, people that he's angry at, political disputes, squabbles, <laughs> and and so he'll just go on. You know, so after he, he would tells tell a story, story, and then he would like his commentary would be longer than the story, right? And <laughs> and even more so though than than Phaedrus, who's writing poetry. You know, so he's keeping things under control, more or less. If you look at the medieval Aesop, one of the things that happens there is Aesop gets turned into allegories uh, by medieval preachers who recognize the value of Aesop's fables that people could use, say, in sermons. Very useful to have these memorable stories that you could stick into a sermon to illustrate some kind of point, uh, emphasize some kind of moral virtue, say. And in the Middle Ages, what some of them would do was that they would have the Aesop's fable and then they would have a whole allegory attached to it where... I, the, can you define the, allegory for us so that we can... Al- just- exactly. Allegory is kind of like treating uh, uh, stories as a secret code. Uh, so, for example, there's an Aesop's fable about the fox and the crow and the cheese, okay. right? Famous fable. A lot of people might already know it. Go ahead and tell it. Crow, we like stories. I'm going to tell it. Oh, and they're short. They're short, so they're easy to tell. So, So this crow has found a piece of cheese. Oh, the crow is very happy. The crow flies up into the top of a tree to enjoy his piece of cheese. Well, along comes a fox who would also like to eat that cheese. Mm -hmm. Crow's obviously not going to give it up voluntarily, so the fox has to to trick the crow, right? Fox is a trickster. Mm -hmm. And so the fox says, oh, crow, look at you up there looking so beautiful as usual with your beautiful plumage. I'm sure you, that your voice, it must be just as beautiful as, as, as your plumage. Maybe you could sing me a song. And the crow is so flattered because no uh-huh. one says the crow is beautiful. No one really likes to hear the crow sing. But here's the fox and the fox wants the crow to sing. So the crow opens his mouth and starts to sing. And of course, the cheese falls out and the fox takes it and runs away. Now, where are you going to insert the moral, right? So in some cases, the fox... As she's running off with the cheese, might say, oh, crow, you would have been done better not to have opened your mouth at all because now your mouth is empty and my mouth is full of cheese or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Well, in the Middle Ages, to allegorize that, it's like, who, who is the fox? <gasps> the fox is the devil. The mm-hmm. fox is the devil coming to tempt you mm-hmm. with flattery, with praises, trying to get you to open your mouth to, to, to say things you shouldn't say and to, and to lose the sweet cheese of salvation that you hold mm-hmm. in your mouth. So 
<laughs> these allegories might strike us as, as kind of silly. Now, allegorical interpretations are not in vogue, let's say, but they were in vogue for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And so the fables of Aesop were allegorized. The, the, the stories of Ovid, for example, were allegorized because this is a way that Christian writers could take on these pagan stories and Christianize them. You know, by mm -hmm. providing these allegories, um, you're able to put an alien story, a story from another culture, inside your culture, uh, uh, giving it a, a Christian framework. And so that's something that uh, is happening at that point 2,000 years after Aesop. And it would be amazing. It would be wonderful if we could see what, what Aesop would say about all that. Mm -hmm. There are some parallels between ancient Greek and Roman culture and how they saw divine symbols, divine messages around them in the world. Um, and there's even a funny Aesop fable that I'll tell in just a second that's definitely not fit for children. Um, <laughs> Uh, that shows how in the ancient world too, they did these kinds of interpretations, right? It wasn't about allegories of the devil and Jesus, but it were other kinds of um, interpretations. So this is the, the Aesop's fable. I think this one's really funny. So, you know, in the ancient world, there were things called portents, like strange things that happened that were weird or bizarre and, 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 and you had to interpret them so that, so that you could fix whatever was wrong, right? This this portent was a sign that, that something had gone wrong and you might need to go and make a sacrifice to a god or a goddess. You might need mm -hmm. to make a pilgrimage. You might need to, to, to change something in your house. You might need a ritual prayer. You, you, you would need something because this portent is letting you know that something really terrible has happened. And Aesop was reputed to be a very wise person. So one day there's a, 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 a Aesop is walking along and this man comes running up to him. He's like, Aesop, Aesop, you have to help me. There's there's this this terrible portent that's happened at, at my house. There are these lambs that have been born with human heads. What what am I gonna do? You know, the gods are clearly offended, but but I don't know what to do. Can you help me, Aesop? And Aesop says, Yeah, I think so. Probably the best thing you could do is get wives for your shepherds. Wise for your shepherds. Oh man! So we interpret it not in terms of you know the act of the gods being manifest in the portent of these strange births, but uh, making a joke about the habits yes. of yes. shepherds out on their own without wives. So anyway, you're not going to find that in any of the right yes. of these <laughs> fables for children. Um, but, but that's an example of how they're already allegorical and and interpretive tendencies, let's say, in the Aesop's fables. And I mentioned Rumi at the beginning. Rumi, oh my gosh, classical Persian Sufi poet does an absolutely beautiful job of allegorizing uh, Aesop's fables and all kinds of other stories uh, in a, uh, Islamic con context, okay. showing how there are uh, deep messages about Islamic salvation and Islamic spirituality uh, in these animal stories. And Rumi is, is that a, a male or a female? It, uh, Rumi is a, a a man. He is the uh, the founder of a mystical order in Sufism that people might have heard of, uh, uh, the Whirling Dervishes, uh, because a ritual sacred dance was part of uh, their ecstatic worship of God, uh, as well as the ecstatic utterances of poetry. And so that's what Rumi is is uh, famous. And so for. he would. Would he take these fables and he would write them into poetry, into allegory? Exactly. So he would do these poems and um, some of them he would utter ecstatically, but they're also written down in very elaborate, large collections. And he interweaves the, um, uh, the interpretation, the allegorical interpretation as he tells the story stage by stage. And he also does something absolutely beautiful that you don't find so much in the Greek and Roman traditions where he nests stories within stories. So sometimes oh, wow. you feel like a, kind of like in the uh, thousand and one nights where you feel kind of lost. It's like, wait, were we, didn't we start with a, a lion and a fox? I, I, I don't remember how we even started, you know, and he has to work his way back out. And you can find that uh, tradition of, 
nested fables, nested animal stories. It goes back to ancient India. And that's another one of the sources uh, for Aesopic type fables later in Europe, because what happens is that those very popular uh, collections of fables from the Middle East that, uh, uh, well, they started in India, they spread throughout the Middle East, and then they came to Europe, um, uh, especially via uh, uh, Jewish writers who would take the versions they knew uh, from Arabic or from Hebrew and translate them into Latin. Uh, those uh, stories enter the Aesopic tradition detached from their frameworks, unfortunately, because it's such a pleasure to read these wonderful nested stories. The nested stories never really caught on in the Aesopic tradition because Aesop's fables all about short, all about simple. But mm -hmm. some of the stories that are known from those nested books, uh, those show up in Aesop's fables. And I have to say something about Buddhism too, while we're talking about allegorizing things. It, it, this, this is what religious traditions do, right? They, they look at popular culture and find ways to bring that popular culture into a religious framework of understanding. Mm -hmm. The oldest collection of folk tales, I want to say, that we have in the world are the Buddhist Jataka tales, which okay. are stories that the Buddha supposedly told and the way he interprets those stories to bring them into a Buddhist framework. And they're, they're, folk tales of, of India, often with animal characters, very much like Aesop's fables, is that they are the stories of his past lives. And so that's what the Jataka means, his, his past lives. And so the Buddha would tell these stories in his community to his followers, uh, helping to explain some problem that they're having to teach a lesson that will help the community to improve. And at the end of these stories, he would say, yes. And in that story, you know, I was the virtuous tree spirit, or I was the brave little quail, and so-and-so was this character in the story. And so the way he does the, the allegory or the interpretation is in terms of his past lives, which is really cool. Yeah. I, and so some of the stories in ancient Greek Aesop's fables are the same stories that you find in the Buddhist Jataka tales. And we're never really going to know, did the stories go from India to Greece, that's very possible. Did the stories go from Greece to India? Also extremely possible. We're never gonna uh, get the written evidence we need to answer that question. All we can say is they went one way or the other, because um, there they are. <laughs> so we don't, know, we don't know the origins of where they started from and how they, how they spread. We know what how they spread in terms of the geography, we're not going to get a chronology, you know, so for okay. the people who want this to be all historical and written down, mm -hmm. you're going to be disappointed. But if you just enjoy the stories, there are hundreds and hundreds of Aesop's fables attested in ancient Greece and Rome. And then when you get into the Renaissance, there are hundreds more that become part of the Aesopic tradition and are pretty much absorbed into it. And then when you get to the 17th and 18th centuries, people start writing uh, new Aesopic fables, just inspired by the tradition as, as storytellers, often as poet storytellers, they write even more. So that uh, if you were to do a compendium, and I kind of hope to do one, of the European Aesop in its biggest form, uh, I'm for sure I'll be able to get to 1,500. Maybe I'll be able to get to 2,000. I did a book a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, called um, 1,001 Fables, inspired by the 1,001 Nights. I thought, okay, I'll do a book of 1,001 Fables in Latin. And I did. So that's a that's a free book. You can find it at my website, uh, or Gibbs. So, but it's written in Latin, so you, be, you have it's, to be able to, to read Latin in order to read it? See, now is that not an incentive to learn Latin? Oh, anybody <laughs> Latin who wants to learn Latin. Uh, most of them do appear somewhere, somehow, in English translation. But that is that is one of the things I want to do now, is go back to that book now that I'm retired and and um, make sure that there are English translations of them. And so if they're not, I'll do an English translation. But, you know, now people really want, oh, the oldest Aesop's fables, the authentic Greek ones. I'm really just interested in any good fable. And that was the case also in the Renaissance and 16th, 17th, 18th century. They, they were really interested in all the fables. They didn't have a, a historical origins kind of obsession about it. And uh -huh. so there are actually some English translations like 
Sir Roger Lestrange's 17th century Aesop is full of uh, Aesopic fables that are, are uh, medieval or Renaissance in origin. It's a great English translation, really uh, fun to read. Can you give us a fable um, and show us how it uh, was in different places and how it looked different in different continents and different countries? Is, is there a fable that you can walk us through this uh, back and forth with to give us yeah. a concrete example? Well, uh, one that's a, a lot of fun because it reflects uh, different um, uh, practices in keeping uh, domestic animals, pets. Uh, there's a, a famous fable that you'll find in English versions of Aesop that's about a, a man who falls in love with his cat. And he is just desperately in love with his cat. And so he prays to the goddess Venus to turn his cat into a woman. And uh, different fables give different interpretations of, of Venus's motivations and her attitude about all this, but she does agree. And, and so she turns the cat into a beautiful woman, beautiful cat, beautiful woman. And, and so there's the wedding. And so the man is so happy. They have this, you know, lavish wedding. And then a mouse runs across the floor of the room. And the bride, seeing this mouse, gets down on all fours and goes chasing after the mouse because she's still a cat inside. And Venus is just totally disgusted and says, oh, if she wants to chase mice, I'm just going to turn her back into a cat. And so... <sighs> The, the moral of the story is that people are how they are. They're, there's a strong conservative tendency in Aesop like that, that you can't change people's natures. Mm -hmm. Well, ancient versions of that fable are not about a cat. They're about a weasel because the ancient Greeks and Romans did not keep cats. That was a Egyptian thing to do, but they kept weasels uh, for mice control. And mm -hmm. you know, weasels are just pretty cool. So they had weasels. Are, and is a weasel like a ferret? I, I'm trying to exactly. picture what a weasel is. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So a weasel is like a ferret, exactly. Okay. And, and some people do keep ferrets as pets, even right. now, yeah. so, right? Not inconceivable about um, uh, the, the nice weasels. Um, and so that's an example of a fable that's, that, that shifts and, and changes based on the historical context. You, uh -huh. If you wanted... To tell the fable about a weasel, you could, but it would be kind of weird because people wouldn't be able to connect to it. But a story about a cat, that totally works. And so mm -hmm. it becomes a story about a cat. And there's great art of this, of course, because one of the, the lovely things about modern Aesop, especially as it becomes imagined for children, but not just in children's books, there's there are often illustrations to go with Aesop's fables. Right. Um, because since the fable is so short, you can encapsulate the whole idea of the story in a single image. So there, um, mm -hmm. like for example, with this cat, there's a, a an illustration I can see in my mind's eye right now, and the mouse doesn't show up at the wedding banquet. This is actually in the bedroom later, uh, where the, uh, the woman is jumping off the marriage bed and her poor husband is there shocked in the bed. And, um, and, and she's, she's still a woman, but she's looking mm -hmm. really fierce and her fingers are kind of bent like cat's claws going after this mouse. Um, and I should say about illustrated Aesop's at the New York public library online, you can see a beautiful scan of their Medici Aesop, which is a really fascinating book you know, the Renaissance is about Greek culture and Greek language coming back to Western Europe. And one of the things that happened was we got Greek texts of Aesop in Western Europe during the Renaissance, but most people couldn't read Greek, right? And so the Medicis got themselves a beautiful manuscript, Greek manuscript of Aesopic fables mm -hmm. written by a Greek scholar. This is lovely, but of course they can't read it. So they get illustrations done for each of the fables in this yeah. manuscript. And the illustrations are absolutely gorgeous. They are full color, uh, uh, painted, basically tiny miniature paintings in this Aesop's fable. So you can just imagine the Medicis, you know, flipping through their manuscript. They can't read the Greek. It's like, oh, I recognize that one. That's, that's 
Jupiter and 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 the eagle and the and the dung beetle. I I I recognize it. So you can see uh -huh. that absolutely gorgeous manuscript um, online at the New York Public Library. Uh, so that's something it's just a beautiful resource. Really exciting to see. One of the things I found, um, I, I I mentioned to you before that I had been reading some Aesopic fables to my children, right. and some of them. I find the morals are kind of strange. Like they don't culturally fit with how we are today. So like one of them is the cat's bell. Um, and it's all about how there's this, this family of mice and they're happy until the farmer gets a cat and the cat, the cat's job is to eat the mice and the, and the, the cat is so good at sneaking up on the mice because he's so quiet. And so they all get together and decide. Um, we need to decide to do something to get, you know, so that we aren't always caught off guard by this cat. And someone says, let's put a bell around the cat. And someone's like, oh, well, that's a good idea, but who's going to do it? And then that's basically the end of the story. And they say, you know, the moral of the story is you can have a good idea, but if no one's going to, I, I'm not, you know, usually those little morals are like very succinct, but I can't remember the exact line, but I, I feel like culturally that's not, <laughs> it doesn't jive with where we would, would stop a story. Well, and part of the, the, that's such a great example. And I love that you brought that up because um, Belling the Cat is one of those fables that's become part of the, people recognize it as an Aesop's fable and it shows up in all kinds of books now, but that's not attested in the uh, the ancient Greek and Roman collections of Aesop's fables, and it's also a great example of a, a story. As you as you realize, it's it's a little bit lame as a story, right? I mean, like uh -huh. it doesn't exactly have a climax. It's got a letdown rather than yeah. than a climax, and and that's probably a story that really circulated more as a proverb. And there's a strong connection, really strong connection between Aesop's fables and proverbs. And so we have this word fable and we have this word proverb, but there's some things that are sort of like in between. They're kind of fably and they're kind of like a proverb. And if you look at other languages, like one of the things I've been working on a lot is, is looking at fables in African folk traditions in oral literature, if you will, in Africa. And there's some African languages where they have the same word for both what we would call a fable and what we would call a proverb, that the connection between fables and proverb is so strong that they don't even have separate words for them. So something like belling the cat is, is, a, is a kind of proverb that doesn't express a moral, it doesn't express a precept, it's just a very elegant way to describe a situation that, that happens. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's belling the cat. The lion's share is another really good example where the lion's share, very well attested, very ancient Aesop's fable, um, you have that phrase, the lion's share. That's really the proverbial expression of that fable. The lion's share, that's all you have to say because it's supposed to remind you of the story. Mm -hmm. It's not even a story that you, you would tell necessarily. You can just say the lion's share. And the the moral, if you will, or the observation is a kind of negative one, like with Belling the Cat with the lion's share. You know, that's the fable about the animals who go hunting with the lion and then foolishly expect that they're going to share at the end what they caught equally. No, that's not going to happen. The lion's going to take everything and the lion's share <laughs> is not a share at all. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. The lion's <laughs> share is everything. And so if you're foolish enough to hunt with a lion, pff, the lion's share. Um, another one that, that circulates like that, just in a very abbreviated uh, kind of proverbial form is sour grapes. And sour grapes is an interesting one because I would uh, sometimes when I was teaching back when I first started um, and I was in a classics department when I first started, I would uh, check on my students what they call proverbial competency, which is something that anthropologists who study uh, proverbs are interested in, you know, just, just how well do people actually uh, uh, understand proverbs? Do they recognize the proverbs in their culture? Can they apply them properly? And sour grapes is one that really surprised me. That's from the Aesop's fable about the fox who's going along and she sees the beautiful grapes hanging from the trellis, beautiful, ripe grapes hanging from the trellis. So she jumps, mm -hmm. she jumps, and she jumps, and she can't 
reach the grapes. And so she goes off all huffy puffy and says, who wants sour grapes anyway? And sour grapes then becomes this amazing little two word phrase that encapsulates the idea that people speak badly about something they want that they can't get. You know, mm-hmm. talk about an elaborate psychological thing being expressed in just two words. But yeah. see, my students would say, oh, sour grapes, that means something is bad, right? Because they're just, they don't have the story in their heads anymore. They just have the phrase sour grapes and they're trying to guess what it means. The lion, uh-huh. some of them would say, oh, the lion share, that's the biggest share. Right. No, the whole point of the lion share is that it's not a share at all. The whole point of sour grapes is that the grapes aren't sour, but the fox can't get to them. So there's all kinds of things that go on in that space that we call, say, the moral of the fable that doesn't have anything to do with morality, actually. Sometimes the fables, you know, teach a kind of virtue, but by and large, Aesop's fables are pretty negative. They're usually about a mistake that someone makes, usually a fatal mistake. And it's often making fun of that person or animal who makes the mistake, even when it's fatal. And it's what's called a negative exemplum. Uh, so uh-huh. if you go uh, any collection of Aesop's fables, maybe not so much the children's ones, because the children's collections try to emphasize the positive, which is a distortion, really, of the Aesopic tradition and, say, older collections of Aesop. So the ancient medieval Renaissance collections, the, the, the number of negative exempla far outnumber the, the positive ex- exempla, the, 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 the stories that teach you what to do by showing you what happens if you do the wrong thing. So don't be like the foolish animals that went hunting with the lion. Don't be mm-hmm. like the foolish fox. And the fable of that fox and the crow and the cheese, the moral of the story is not, oh, that bad fox. The moral of the story is don't be an idiot. Like don't fall for the fox's tricks. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So the problem is not the trickster. The problem is you fallen <laughs> tricks so talk a little bit about how the fables were not originally intended for a, a children but now they're all entirely marketed towards children how did that uh what did, what was the word you use infantilization is that the word yep. you used yeah it um is, occur it's, it's it's very much about um what happens when we develop literate culture, academic culture, uh, 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 scientific culture, you know, all of those things are are, are sort of uh, meant to be, claimed to be superior to traditional oral popular cultures. And so Mm -hmm. if we're going to keep Aesop around and, you know, Aesop is from the classical world, you know, the venerable, great classical world. So, you know, Aesop has some claims to being kept around. Um, the, the idea then is that the, the, what position is Aesop going to assume in this new world, this world where we're literate, this world where we have experts, this world where we have scientific truth, where we have reality and realism. Um, well, talking animals, fantasy like that, that's for kids. And so it's really the talking animals that did Aesop in more than anything else. You know, so if you look at, say, Proverbs, people don't, don't take Proverbs as seriously, say, as they used to do. And they basically don't know as many Proverbs as they used to. But there's not a sense that Proverbs are for children. Proverbs have just been kind of marginalized. They haven't really been Mm -hmm. infantilized. But Aesop's fables, because of those talking animals, you got talking animals, the kids have got stuffed animals in their bedrooms, they're talking to their stuffed animals, you know, it just ends up there. And it's kind of heartbreaking for me because even a great scholar like Joseph Jacobs, who really appreciated the whole vast complex, beautiful history of Aesop's fables, the, the, the way that Aesop's fables were important in so many cultures for so many reasons. He also thinks that in the modern world, Aesop's fables are just for children. He doesn't see mm-hmm. that they have 
any value now. So in, in your intro to the, the podcast at the beginning, you know, you talked about the, the relevance of, of, of uh, folk tales and folklore for the world now. And I think Aesop's fables are incredibly relevant for now. Um, and what, what makes you think that they're relevant? Why, oh, because it, make a, a convincing argument for us. Well, one of the most important things that some of the fables did and say in the ancient world was to give a way for slaves um, to, to complain bitterly and vociferously about their lot in life. You know, it was a form of expression that was clearly used by marginalized people, slaves, mm -hmm. for example, um, to, to complain about the injustice of the world that they lived in. So there's a whole group of Aesop's fables that are very much about the injustice done to people, like a, a, a really uh, intense, sad, horrifying one, is, mm -hmm. is this poor donkey. And the donkey often stands in for the slave. You can see why, you know, because the donkey is this, this beast of burden. And so this donkey right. is complaining about, oh, my life, my life is so awful. It's just so awful to be a donkey. You know, I just, the only thing that's going to set me free from this awful life is, is when I die. Okay, so the donkey dies. And what do they do? They make his skin into a drum so that he is beaten even after he dies. That, mm -hmm. that you know, so for people who want to say normalize slavery in the ancient world and translate the world slave just as servant, it's like you look at a fable like that and you realize that there was a, 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 an overwhelming grief and rage about slavery and it comes out in this little fable and you can see like there, there aren't illustrations of Aesop's fables from the ancient world but when you look at, say, an illustration of that fable in, in uh, Caxton's Aesop, that 15th century English Aesop, it collapses the fable into one frame. And so you often see that happen. The whole plot of the fable is told in a single picture. So you see this very sad looking donkey with his head sort of cast down. And then you see a man just playing a drum right next to that donkey. So there it all is in one picture that the, the donkey is still going to be beaten even after he dies. So the, so the Aesop's fables are this kind of contested space. You have these, these fables that are very much about injustice. But because it's a contested space, you also have these fables that were clearly told by the, the people in power, uh, by, by, by masters, by slave owners, fables that were designed to keep the slaves in their place. And so I mentioned before, there's some fables that are extremely conservative in their, in their philosophy and their, their outlook on the world, because those are the fables mm -hmm. that were being told to try to keep slaves down, to, to, to not um, uh, exceed their station. So for example, here's another donkey fable. And my students always used to just get angry about this one because it's like, yes, this is total injustice. So there's this donkey <laughs> and he actually loves his master. And he sees the master's little pet dog. And the little pet dog runs and jumps on the master's lap and licks the master's face. And the, the master loves it when the donkey does, or when the dog does this and pets the dog. And it's like, oh, my dog, you really love me. Well, the donkey loves him too, loves his master. And so he's going to show his master that he really loves him. So he goes running in and he puts his hooves up in the master's lap and starts licking his face. And of course, the <laughs> master is outraged and he calls for his, his, his human slaves to come and beat that donkey. In some versions, no. beat the donkey to death because you should not rise above your station. If you're a field slave, you're going to stay out in the field. You are not going to try to be the master's pet. How about that? Right. So yeah, that's not, I can see why and, that would be heartbreaking. <laughs> and so when I said that the, the fables aren't just for children, it's partly because there's some fables that are about sex and incest and rape and they're horrible. But then there are also fables like this one, which are heartbreaking and a, a negative exemplum, you know, that's intended to be teaching the lesson of field slaves stay out there in the field. But of course, we don't respond to it that way. We respond to it at, with this sense of 
outrage and protest is like, how can that be the end of the story? And so you can find, mm -hmm. for example, sometimes the, the sermons that get attached to these stories later on try to change the meaning. And you can also find some, some stories where the, um, the plot gets even flipped or extended. Like there's a great example already in Phaedrus because Phaedrus had, he was a freedman. He had a real sense of, of, of the indignity of, of slavery and what it was like to be a slave. So there's a story that he tells. There are all kinds of stories about uh, uh, wolves and sheep, where the sheep are the victim of the wolves. And so there's this story about a, a sheep. I won't go into the details, but she ends up having to, to uh, sell off all her, her wool because she's been uh, 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 falsely accused in a court case, witnesses have lied. And so she's had to shave off her wool. And in some versions of the fable, she dies of cold because she doesn't have any wool. But I'm pretty sure it's in Phaedrus. I, I hope I'm remembering this right, but whatever, somewhere out there, I'm pretty sure in Phaedrus, she goes along and she sees her accuser, the wolf, dead in a ditch. There's no explanation of how the wolf ended up dead in a ditch, but she sees him dead in the ditch and she says, serves you right. You know, so that it really doesn't fit the Aesopic model. The end of the story yeah. should just be the, the crow lost his cheese, the sheep lost her wool. This is what happens right. when, when you, you fall into the clutches of, 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 of schemers. Uh, but Phaedra somehow wanted to give a, a, a more righteous ending to that, to that fable. Mm -hmm. So he puts the schemer in the ditch and, and lets the sheep have the, the last word floating over that, that wolf. And this happens with the shifting, the changing with the fables, you know, because it, it's, it's oral. There's not one official version. You know, every storyteller mm -hmm. tells it their own way for their own audience, for their own purposes. And you see that in every version of Aesop's fables. How interesting. So what has been mo the most um, shocking re relation to you or something that we, we haven't covered that you feel like is really important that we, we uh, talk about? I, I would just say that the, the most important thing that I wanted to share with everybody is that the uh, Aesop's fables is a tradition that really embraces the whole world. You find Aesopic type fables everywhere. And so I would really hope that we could, you know, keep using the, the label Aesopic because it's a handy way to talk about these, you know, short fables with a, a punchline or a point, um, but, but not think that somehow it's, it's the special cultural possession of ancient Greece. You know, it's just a kind of, of label. And some people have proposed other labels like beast fable you'll see sometimes used. But, but I guess I would like to say that, you know, we could use this Aesopic fable label uh, for all kinds of stories. <laughs> and I've been working a lot, like I said, on African stories and finding all kinds of Aesopic fables there, including like familiar Aesopic fables that either uh, uh, came to Africa or like in the example from India before stories that uh, uh, came to Africa or came from Africa, you know, there were Greeks and Romans running all over Northern Africa. So it's, it's not really clear, you know, which way the stories were going, but they're Aesopic fables in Africa. And for listeners out there, it, whatever cultural tradition you belong to, if there's some Aesopic type fables in your culture, let me know because I love to collect them, find out about them. Um, uh, I'm easy to find it at Twitter. I blog all the time, lordgives.net. And I would just be fascinated to know about Aesopic type fables in anybody else's cultures. And we'll definitely put your link up on our, our page, uh, which is www.fabricofolklore.com uh, so that anyone can get in contact you with you and and find all of your your links that you've mentioned today. And anything that's not on your website, we'll, we'll put up on, on our website as well. Fantastic. But I did have a, a question. When you were talking about the African fables, uh, one of the stories that stuck out in my head from my childhood was this how the elephant got its nose. And I cannot find that book. It's, it's, is it where it was, someone grabbed on his nose and pulled on the it? crocodile? Yeah. The crocodile grabbed his nose, and that's how the elephant gets his nose. Is that an example of a fable? Because it's a longer tale. It's not right. a short. It, well, it could be told in a very short manner, and and that mm -hmm. actually launches into another subject. Maybe I could come back sometime and talk about India. Yeah, that's the <laughs> the most famous version of that is from Rudyard Kipling's Just So Stories. You know, mm -hmm. Rudyard Kipling. Uh, uh, Grew up in India, 
uh, and and his work is infused with 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 uh, elements of Indian culture. He did Jungle Book, you know, with the animals, uh, but at the same time, it's not folklore. And so the whole position of, of just so stories is an example of a literary imitation of a type of fable that's called an etiological fable. And there actually are lots of etiological fables in Aesop too. We didn't talk about that, so I'm glad you brought that up. But that type of story of how a certain animal uh, uh, got its physical feature or why a certain animal does what it does, you'll find th those types of stories in Aesop's fables. Um, but you also find them in in all kinds of other uh, myths and stories. But 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 that one about the uh, the elephant's nose that people usually know that from Kipling's Just So stories, which are pretty long literary type stories. And there's a wonderful uh -huh. book I want to recommend, a, a recent book called Not So Stories, <laughs> uh, where uh, writers from India and maybe other places in South Asia, I don't remember, decided that they wanted to do a book of stories to sort of reclaim this tradition from colonizer Rudyard Kipling to reclaim it for themselves, for their own. It's called Not So Stories, and I'm pretty sure it's available as a Kindle. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll put that uh, that link up because that would be um, that would be a, a, a great book to read to my kids. I mean, is it a, it's intended for children? Uh, some I love... Some of the stories are, it's it, some not, um, but I'll tell you, Kipling is so really not for children because he's it's, it sounds very old fashioned now. So I would recommend take a look at the not so stories. But I could tell you so many amazing books of folk tales from India that are for children. So honestly, if you want to have me come back, I because I, I okay, I Indian folk we'll, 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 we'll have you it. we'll have you on later on too to talk about this topic too. <laughs> oh wait, well. Thank you so much for coming on. This is a fascinating topic. Well, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And thank you, Focal, Focal Ruse, for following us on this quest of Aesopic fables around the world. Hopefully you enjoyed yourself as much as I did. And like we said, the, all the links that we've mentioned today will be on www.fabricoffolklore.com. And we also have um, an Instagram page and a Facebook community page where... This is a page that we've created for you to have dialogue with us, to tell us what you thought about today's show, uh, what you want to hear about in, in future episodes. So this is really an engagement page for you that we've, we've created. So we, we want to hear uh, your thoughts about uh, our, our shows and what your favorite part of the episode was. And if you're enjoying our show, one of the best ways that you can help us is to share, comment, rate, and review. And anyone who gives us a review, I am going to give a shout out on the next episode. So please give us all the stars and a fantastic review. And I will give you a, a thank you on our episode. Um, so if you are looking for different ways to share, you can make a TikTok video about your new favorite podcast, Fabric of Folklore. And, you know, on TikTok, I don't really understand. I'm not really on TikTok, but people seem to do a lot of dancing and pointing at uh, dialogue, dialogue boxes. So that's all you have to do, you know, dance and point at a dialogue box. Um, so thanks so much for joining us while we unraveled the mysteries of folklore. Keep the folk alive, and until next time.